The Despair of Judas by Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. In this video, the visions of Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich describe the despair of Judas and his suicide. She also details the imprisonment of Jesus in a subterranean prison. The following Virgo Potens production is a narrated video of chapters 12 and 14 from the Dolorous Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ by Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. Narrated by Tony Capo Bianco. The text of the Dolorous Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ is in the public domain. All of the pictures used in this video are also in the public domain. Chapter 12 Jesus Confined in the Subterranean Prison. The Jews, having quite exhausted their barbarity, shut Jesus up in a little vaulted prison, the remains of which subsist to this day. Two of the archers alone remained with him, and they were soon replaced by two others. He was still clothed in the old dirty mantle, and covered with the spittle and other filth which they had thrown over him, for they had not allowed him to put on his own clothes again, but kept his hands tightly bound together. When our Lord entered this prison, he prayed most fervently that his heavenly Father would accept all that he had already suffered, and all that he was about to suffer, as an expiatory sacrifice, not only for his executioners, but likewise for all who in future ages might have to suffer torments such as he was about to endure, and to be tempted to impatience or anger. The enemies of our Lord did not allow him a moment's respite, even in this dreary prison, but tied him to a pillar which stood in the center and would not allow him to lean upon it. Although he was so exhausted from ill-treatment, the weight of his chains, and his numerous falls, that he could scarcely support himself on his swollen and torn feet, never for a moment did they cease insulting him, and when the first set were tired out, others replaced them. It is quite impossible to describe all that the Holy of Holies suffered from these heartless beings, for the sight affected me so excessively that I became really ill, and I felt as if I could not survive it. We ought, indeed, to be ashamed of that weakness and susceptibility which renders us unable to listen composedly to the descriptions or speak without repugnance of those sufferings which our Lord endured so calmly and patiently for our salvation." The horror we feel is as great as that of a murderer who is forced to place his hands upon the wounds he himself has inflicted on his victim. Jesus endured all without opening his mouth, and it was man, sinful man, who perpetrated all these outrages against one who was at once their brother, their redeemer, and their God. I too am a great sinner, and my sins caused these sufferings. At the day of judgment, when the most hidden things will be manifested, we shall see the share we have had in the torments endured by the Son of God. We shall see how far we have caused them by the sins we so frequently commit, and which are, in fact, a species of consent which we give to, and a participation in, the tortures which were inflicted on Jesus by his cruel enemies." If, alas, we reflected seriously on this, we should repeat with much greater fervor the words which we find so often in prayer books, Lord, grant that I may die, rather than ever willfully offend thee again by sin. Jesus continued to pray for his enemies, and they, being at last tired out, left him in peace for a short time, when he leaned against the pillar to rest, and a bright light shone around him. The day was beginning to dawn, the day of his passion, of our redemption, and a faint ray, penetrating the narrow vent hole of the prison, fell upon the holy and immaculate Lamb, who had taken upon himself the sins of the world. Jesus turned towards the ray of light, raised his fettered hands, and, in the most touching manner, returned thanks to his heavenly Father for the dawn of that day, which had been so longly desired by the prophets, and for which he himself had so ardently sighed from the moment of his birth on earth, and concerning which he had said to his disciples, I have a baptism wherewith I am to be baptized, and how am I straightened until it be accomplished? 
I prayed with him, but I cannot give the words of his prayer, for I was so completely overcome and touched to hear him return thanks to his father for the terrible sufferings which he had already endured for me, and for the still greater which he was about to endure. I could only repeat over and over with the greatest fervor, Lord, I beseech thee, give me these sufferings, they belong to me, I have deserved them in punishment for my sins. I was quite overwhelmed with feelings of love and compassion when I looked upon him thus welcoming the first dawn of the great day of his sacrifice, and that ray of light which penetrated into his prison might indeed be compared to the visit of a judge who wishes to be reconciled to a criminal before the sentence of death which he has pronounced upon him is executed. The archers, who were dozing, woke up for a moment and looked at him with surprise. They said nothing, but appeared to be somewhat astonished and frightened. Our divine Lord was confined in this prison during an hour, or thereabouts. Whilst Jesus was in this dungeon, Judas, who had been wandering up and down the valley of Hinnom like a madman, directed his steps towards the house of Caiaphas, with the thirty pieces of silver, the reward of his treachery, still hanging to his waist. All was silent around, and he addressed himself to some of the sentinels, without letting them know who he was, and asked what was going to be done to the Galilean. He has been condemned to death, and he will certainly be crucified, was the reply. Judas walked to and fro and listened to the different conversations which were held concerning Jesus. Some spoke of the cruel treatment he had received, others of his astonishing patience, while others again discoursed concerning the solemn trial which was to take place in the morning before the great council. Whilst the traitor was listening eagerly to the different opinions given, day dawned, the members of the tribunal commenced their preparations, and Judas slunk behind the building that he might not be seen, for like Cain he sought to hide himself from human eyes, and despair was beginning to take possession of his soul. The place in which he took refuge happened to be the very spot where the workmen had been preparing the wood for making the cross of our Lord. All was in readiness, and the men were asleep by its side. Judas was filled with horror at the sight. He shuddered and fled when he beheld the instrument of that cruel death to which for a paltry sum of money he had delivered up his lord and master. He ran to and fro in perfect agonies of remorse, and finally hid himself in an adjoining cave, where he determined to await the trial, which was to take place in the morning. Chapter 14 The Despair of Judas Whilst the Jews were conducting Jesus to Pilate, the traitor Judas walked about, listening to the conversation of the crowd who followed, and his ears were struck by words such as these, They are taking him before Pilate. The high priests have condemned the Galilean to death. He will be crucified. They will accomplish his death. He has been already dreadfully ill-treated. His patience is wonderful. He answers not. His only words are that he is the Messiah, and that he will be seated at the right hand of God. They will crucify him on account of those words. Had he not said them, they could not have condemned him to death. The miscreant who sold him was one of his disciples, and had a short time before eaten the paschal lamb with him. Not for worlds would I have had to do with such an act. However guilty the Galilean may be, he has not at all even sold his friend for money. Such an infamous character as this disciple is infinitely more deserving of death. Then, but too late, anguish, despair, and remorse took possession of the mind of Judas. Satan instantly prompted him to fly. He fled as if a thousand furies were at his heel, and the bag which was hanging at his side struck him as he ran, and propelled him as a spur from hell. But he took it into his hands to prevent its blows. He fled as fast as possible, but where did he fly? Not towards the crowd, that he might cast himself at the feet of Jesus, his merciful Savior, implore his pardon, and beg to die with him, not to confess his fault with true repentance before God, but to endeavor to unburden himself before the world of his crime, and of the price of his treachery. 
He ran like one beside himself into the temple, where several members of the council had gathered together after the judgment of Jesus. They looked at one another with astonishment, and then turned their haughty countenances, on which a smile of irony was visible, upon Judas. He, with a frantic gesture, tore the thirty pieces of silver from his side, and holding them forth with his right hand, exclaimed in accents of the most deep despair, Take back your silver, that silver with which you bribed me to betray this just man. Take back your silver. Release Jesus. Our compact is at an end. I have sinned grievously, for I have betrayed innocent blood. The priests answered him in the most contemptuous manner, and as if fearful of contaminating themselves by the contact of the reward of the traitor, would not touch the silver he tended, but replied, What have we to do with thy sin? If thou thinkest to have sold innocent blood, it is thine own affair. We know what we have paid for, and we have judged him worthy of death. Thou hast thy money, say no more. They addressed these words to him in the abrupt tone in which men usually speak when anxious to get rid of a troublesome person, and instantly arose and walked away. These words tilled Judas with such rage and despair that he became almost frantic. His hair stood on end on his head. He rent in two the bag which contained the thirty pieces of silver, cast them down in the temple, and fled to the outskirts of the town. I again beheld him rushing to and fro like a madman in the valley of Hinnom. Satan was by his side in a hideous form, whispering in his ear to endeavor to drive him to despair. All the curses which the prophets had hurled upon this valley, where the Jews formerly sacrificed their children to idols. It appeared as if all these maledictions were directed against him, as in these words, for instance. They shall go forth and behold the carcasses of those who have sinned against me, whose worm dieth not, and whose fire shall never be extinguished. Then the devil murmured in his ears, Cain, where is thy brother Abel? What hast thou done? His blood cries to me for vengeance. Thou art cursed upon earth, a wanderer for ever. When he reached the torrent of Cedron and saw Mount Olivet, he shuddered, turned away, and again the words vibrated in his ear. Friend, whereto art thou come, Judas? Dost thou betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Horror filled his soul, his head began to wander, and the arch fiend again whispered, it was here that David crossed the Cedron when he fled from Absalom. Absalom put an end to his life by hanging himself. It was of thee that David spoke when he said, And they repaid me evil for good, hatred for my love. May the devil stand at his right hand. When he is judged, may he go out condemned. May his days be few, and his bishopric let another take. May the iniquity of his father be remembered in the sight of the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out, because he remembered not to show mercy, but persecuted the poor man and the beggar, and the broken in heart, to put him to death. And he loved cursing, and it shall come unto him. And he put on cursing like a garment, and it went in like water into his entrails, and like oil into his bones." May it be unto him like a garment which covereth him, and like a girdle with which he is girded continually. Overcome by these terrible thoughts, Judas rushed on, and reached the foot of the mountain. It was a dreary, desolate spot, filled with rubbish and putrid remains. Discordant sounds from the city reverberated in his ears, and Satan continually repeated, They are now about to put him to death. Thou hast sold him. Knowest thou not the words of the law? He who sells a soul among his brethren, and receives the price of it, let him die the death. Put an end to thy misery, wretched one. Put an end to thy misery. Overcome by despair, Judas tore off his girdle and hung himself on a tree which grew in a crevice of the rock, and after death his body burst asunder and his bowels were scattered around. End of chapters 12 and 14 from the Dolorous Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ by Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich Narrated by Tony Capo Bianco. So this literally just happened. Here's the video. Okay, this is pretty strange. 
I just finished making this video and I went outside for a moment and the tree right next to my house for the first time has a flock of vultures who are just staying over the night. So I'm not a superstitious person or anything, but this is still a little bit creepy and strange and I thought I'd share that with you. At any rate, I suppose this is a rather fitting ending to a video on the despair of Judas and his hanging of himself. Welcome to the Virgo Potenz YouTube channel. If you enjoy this video, I invite you to visit the Virgo Potenz website at virgopotenz.org. Virgo Potenz has articles, traditional Latin mass resources, transcribed sermons, prayers in English and Latin, narrated videos of the Dolorous Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ by Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, and a spiritual warfare page. I offer the content on the website and YouTube channel for free. But this work is a full-time apostolate, and your support is needed. Please prayerfully consider supporting my work by praying for me, becoming a patron of Virgo Potenz on Patreon, and or by purchasing one of my ebooks. If you'd prefer to give me a one-time contribution, I suggest that you do so by buying one of my ebooks. Links to my ebooks as well as to Patreon can be found at virgopotenz.org. May the Virgin Most Powerful guide and protect you. Thank <laughs> you.